All right, everybody. Um, we're back here with computer networks. Um, and what we're going to do this time is kind of put together the things that we learned for encoding, framing, and error detection here um, and push them all into an actual um, protocol that's used um, and, and talk about multi-axis networks. And this leads into a discussion of wireless networks, but, but it's so fundamental and critical that I, I feel like... Um, I feel like you have to kind of understand these these protocols and, and work with them. Um, inside our book, book.systemsapproach.org, um, this is mostly 2.6. Um, I'm going to be referring, for the most part, to um, my own drawings and whatnot, which, which help complement or supplement the book. Um, but if you would like to read through, um, that is the place to do so. All right, so um, let's look over here um, on my tablet. And I'll be looking down at my tablet for the most part. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is how we put all of these these framing things together in an actual protocol. And in specific, what we're going to talk about is Ethernet. Um, Ethernet was developed kind of in the mid-70s. Um, the formal protocol came out in 1978 um, through, through basically a collaboration of, of three corporations, um, DEC, Intel, and, and Xerox. Um, it's known as a CSMA CD protocol, and, and we're going to bring these these terms to light. But CSMA CD is is something not to forget. Um, it stands for Carrier Sense with with Collision Detection, Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Detection. That's the CSMA CD, and and we're going to actually go through what each of those means and kind of walk through those. Um, it's it's largely built this the CMA CSMA CD is largely built around the Aloha network, um, which was communication between radio towers um, in the Hawaiian Islands that they used to kind of coordinate access and communication between those. Um, the carrier sense idea is the fact that like I can sense if someone is communicating um, so that I don't trample on top of them. Um, tramples can still happen. Um, and that, that is important. And that factors into kind of the, the carrier sense and, and different pieces of the protocol in different ways. Multiple access means that lots of folks can be communicating over this line at once. So, you know, you might have three towers and all three of them may want to communicate. Um, and so they need to sense when the line is busy, transmit when it's not, and, and deal with that situation. And in order to deal with that situation, they have to be able to tell if they're colliding. And, and so this Aloha network informs exactly how Ethernet works. Um, and understanding this means you understand how Ethernet works. Um, but we're we're not going to focus on Aloha. I just I just think it's a neat nod to kind of radio and and history. Um, the book does talk about it a little bit, um, and you can see you can see some of that discussion here um, as they're talking about it. But it comes up in radio too, and and so I think that's that's kind of important and fun because radio has a lot to do with networks as well. All right, so let's talk about Ethernet a little bit. Um, most of you probably know what Ethernet is because. You've, you've probably heard of your Ethernet cable, and, and you're used to thinking about like plugging in an Ethernet cable to connect it to a wall, like if you're in school or something like that, or even in your home, you might plug into your router with an Ethernet cable, um, and, and that's what you think of as Ethernet. And this isn't even spelled correctly. Um, that's what you usually think of as Ethernet probably is, 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 is maybe, maybe this port, maybe this cable, something like that. But Ethernet is actually a protocol at this link layer that describes how to frame and send bits. Um, and, and a lot of these pieces are, are part of the internet, Ethernet protocol in different ways. So your machine will have some Ethernet adapter um, and, and you, you take some Ethernet cord and, and you plug your machine into the wall and suddenly you get internet access. Um, and, and so this is kind of a, a view of the host. So my hosts are going to be yellow here. And my Ethernet cables are going to be this, this magenta color. And when we push this up to kind of many, many machines, you might have a big building or a dorm, or something like that, where there's an Ethernet cable kind of running down the floors of the dorm. But then on each floor, there might be um, many machines that are kind of tapped into the same line. Now, this this is kind of an old view of, of what this situation might look like. Um, this also maps to Aloha most directly, and it also maps to Wi-Fi a little bit. Um, but Probably if you're using Ethernet, like in your dorm or something like that, or, or in a, an office building, probably they're using something like switched Ethernet, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but without that, what happens is the, these, these machines all kind of tap into the same line, and they are connected together with hubs or repeaters, 
Um, so if you've heard of Ethernet hubs, Ethernet hubs are, are really, really dumb. Their only job is just to basically take the bits they get and forward it out along any other lines that they have. So all the stuff that comes in goes out. Any any inputs go to the outputs. Like it's it's really dumb. It's it's kind of the the most basic dumbest adapter or device that you could throw onto a network. And and by dumb I just mean it doesn't make any decisions. It doesn't it doesn't do anything but forward things. It keeps the power levels high. Um, but but it doesn't like make any decisions. So this is what we mean by multiple access. So all of these machines can access this same line. And this has a lot of consequences um, that we've talked about a little bit before. But um, the, the, the entire network here, everything that's connected via these hubs is inside what's called the same collision network. And I'll, I'll move out here a little bit. These are all inside the same collision domain. And what that means is, is if this, this particular um, dudette is transmitting at the same time as this particular dude, um, then these messages will collide because these hubs send all information kind of on all available lines here. And so anything that's kind of in this entire network, if they try to transmit at the same time, they're going to collide. And you might be like, that seems like a bad idea. Well, it turns out to work pretty well. Um, as, as you get too busy, it can become a problem, but um, <laughs> this is, works very, very well. And I think this sort of technology is tucked into USB, but, but don't, don't hold me to that. I think USB uses a similar sort of mechanism. Um, and, and we'll talk about some of the specifics on, on how that happens. Um, some cool things to note to connect this kind of back to where we were. Um, this protocol originally used, it, used Manchester encoding, um, but we know that that makes you lose 50% of your transmission rate. Um, so most of the time they now use <clears throat> an 8B slash 10B sort of mechanism. Um, we, we learned about 4B, 5B. Um, 8B just pushes this up to the byte level. So if I get 8, eight bits in, then I'm actually going to transmit 10 bits. And, and you can kind of see the similarities between these two. We're, we're not going to talk about that algorithm, but they this is more typical now. And so this, this does kind of the NRZI um, force you not to have too many zeros in a row sort of situation. Um, and, and that's great. Um, there is a four hub maximum inside Ethernet. Um, when you put all of the details together, this gives you a 2,500 meter total max length of kind of a single Ethernet network. Um, there, there are lots of ways um, that, that you could extend this or change this, but there are a bunch of implications, and, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those. Um, and there are different Ethernet protocols, and we're kind of talking about kind of the, the earliest, simplest one, um, but, but there's lots, and and there are protocols to make some of this stuff run bigger with super frames and stuff like that. But, but we're kind of talking about the basics here. So, so we're just kind of getting started there. Um, so let's move on. So you know what multiple access is, um, in a modern version of ethernet, and, and this probably does exist in most of your dorms, instead of actually tapping all into kind of the same line through hubs where the hubs are kind of dumb, um, often you'll use these link layer switches. You might think of these as routers. Um, and their job is similar to routers, but because this is operating kind of on this link layer, we call them switches. Um, and these these words do do mean something's different. Um, and in a sense, you know, when a message comes from this machine, it's going to have some place where it's going. And this switch can be smart in the sense that if it's not meant for this machine, then it won't send it there. And so that has a lot of um, that helps a little bit with security and things like that. Now, of course, on a wireless network like the Aloha network, you know, you you don't have any option. Everybody can hear this message. There's not much option to kind of switch that information. But in a wired network, you really can. Um, don't don't call these routers, um, although you you probably will accidentally do so. They're they're not. These operate on the link layer. They can they can work on frames. Um, the the actual frame structure of, of Ethernet is pretty simple. Um, there's a preamble, which is, you can think of it as like a, a starting set of bits. It's pretty long. It's 64 bits long, and it's alternating ones and zeros um, so that you can sync up um, when a frame starts and when it ends. It consists pretty simply of a destination address, your address. There's a type, which allows you to kind of do some of these things, like say whether this is a super frame or not. There's the data itself, which is this section right here. 
Um, and then there's a 32-bit CRC check code, which you all know what that's for from, from the other sections. Um, these bits are added by the adapters and extracted by the adapters. So the host sees um, a 14 bit, 14 byte header, um, and it needs this 14 byte header so that it can decide like if it's trying to respond to one of these messages in some way or another. Um, these these MAC addresses are, these destination addresses are are assigned by the adapter itself. Um, there, each each manufacturer of adapters is given a 24 bit preamble for their destination address, and then each device they make would be like the next bit the next bit sequence, the next 24 bits. Um, so when an Ethernet uh, adapter gets gets a message, generally it's going to say, hey, is the destination address me? Okay, great, then I want to look at that. Or is the is the destination address a broadcast address or a multicast address that I'm assigned to? I'm not going to spend much time on that. Um, but you can kind of enter into a mode where you look at anything that you want. Um, and so basically that means... Anything that's passed along any of these machines in this sort of network, every machine can see, right? That that's that's just how it is. And when you think of radio, like the Aloha network, any anybody who sent messages out across this this radio, anybody could hear. Just like, you know, if you're in the Hawaiian Islands and you had a really powerful voice and you were screaming, you know, everybody that's within hearing distance can hear you screaming, right? Like you're screaming, hello world, everybody can hear you. Um, and that's just the way it is. And if if that message is meant for you, um, then, then the default is that you'll then deal with it. If that message is not meant for you, then the default is that you'll ignore it. But it is possible to listen to everything. Um, so let's talk about what this CSMACD part actually is. Um, our video is getting a little long, so I'll try to be expeditious here. Um, the sender can listen and tell whether a line is idle or not. And this is the carrier sense part. Like, hey, is somebody actually like transmitting something right now? Um, the Ethernet protocol says, if it isn't busy, then let's transmit um, with 100% probability. If the line's not busy, I transmit. Now, Aloha used um, a different probability setup where it was like, um, based on the size of the message I want to see, if, if the line's not busy, then I'll transmit with a certain probability. And if not, I'll wait until the next open slot. And then, and then I'll, 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 I'll maybe transmit then instead. Um, and that's, that's this probability approach. But Ethernet says, if the line's not busy, then I send. Now, if several people were waiting in this same situation, like let's say there was a, a message and two other folks were trying to send a message at the same time, um, then a collision is going to get detected as soon as that message finishes because both of those are going to transmit at the same time. And so what they do is they use this method of exponential backoff. And, and the general idea is that um, if, if I detect a collision and I, as I was sending a message, then what I'll do is I'll wait either zero microseconds or, or one time delta. And the time deltas here are going to be 51.2 microseconds, which I'll explain in a second. And then I'll transmit. And so if two people do that, then you have a, a, a chance of colliding again. Um, if you collide again, then what you do is you kind of increase your, your range of random numbers um, by a factor of two. So instead of just choosing between zero and one time delta, um, you kind of choose between zero and, let's see, what? Uh, a couple of time deltas, right? And there's this exponential increase in how many you're willing to wait. wait. Um, so the first time you choose between zero and one, the second time you choose between zero and two, the next time you might choose between zero and four, the next time you choose between zero and eight. So each time that you kind of run into this collision in a row, um, you pick a larger range of random numbers. And that way, if you have like eight people trying to transmit all at once, um, there is this kind of initial delay where everybody tries to sort out randomly when they'll transmit, and then they'll transmit. And if there's a collision, they'll wait even longer. And generally, this backs people off to the point where the line actually stays busy, which is super cool. And you could go through all the probabilities about how often and when this works and whatnot. And that's super interesting. Um, but generally, the line stays busy um, and the collisions are, are increasingly um, rare, I guess. And so you just retry until it works, increasing this kind of random number exponentially all in one time delta, all which are 51.2 microseconds. Now this this 51.2 microseconds delay is based on 
the fact that Ethernet is is twenty five hundred meters long at max, and it has four hubs at max. And and there is there's a lot of reasons about where this comes from, but but there is this relationship between how long you want to allow Ethernet to be, um, and how long this this time has to be, um, and how big a minimum Ethernet frame has to be. These three things are are coordinated in such a way so that when we look at kind of this longest distance between two two things, if I start transmitting. I need to make sure that if this machine starts transmitting as soon as this first bit shows up, um, that I can detect this collision uh, or, or somebody can detect the collision. Because otherwise what might happen is I, I kind of dump this off into the network um, and then this, this doodad dumps it off into the network and these things are going to collide, but neither of them can actually sense this collision, right? So it needs to be long enough that, well, one person is still transmitting um, by the t when 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 the message actually reached the furthest person away. Now you might say we could cut these distances down and and lower this time delta, and maybe that would make everything faster. You'd be right. Um, you might say, um, hey, doesn't this mean that there's a minimum Ethernet frame? And you'd be right there too, um, because you have to send for a certain period of time. And and I think that number is forty two bytes. Um, but you you could look that up. Okay. Um, we're at. 16 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and kill it there. Um, hopefully you found this interesting um, and you have a, a decent idea of how Ethernet works. I find it really amazing. It has these these overlapping intersections with radio. Um, I'm, I'm an extra class ham radio operator, so I, I find that also interesting. And it shows up in other technologies, right? Um, this algorithm, super simple and, and super dense, but super cool. All right. See you guys next time. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Bye.